Hey, welcome back to the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Well, hey, you're about to listen to the Bitcoin Podcast announcements, and we got to tell you something. What's come to our attention, people didn't realize this, and we got to let you know, these are sponsored episodes, meaning that the participants that come on these episodes have paid to get access to you, and that's the way that works. So, featured on our network means that it's sponsored. So, um, we wanted to get that out in the open. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here it is. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Great. So, uh, thanks for joining us. Would you mind introducing yourself and uh, telling us what role you have at the company? Sure. Uh, so, thanks, Lucien, and thank you to uh, Bitcoin Podcast. Hi. So, my name is Sean. Uh, Sean G. I'm the co-founder of Digix as well as the chief operating officer. Uh, my role here is mostly to manage most of the staff here and uh, the operational activities that have been here in Digix with, with regards to tokenizing gold. Awesome. And uh, your role is specifically in operations. How big of a firm is Digix now? So Digix has been around since December 2014. Currently, we have about 18 people as full-time employees at the moment. Okay. And uh, what's the makeup of your staff? How many technical employees do you have? Uh, So we have about eight technical employees. Um, Five of them sit out in the Philippines, one other is in Indonesia, and two others is in Singapore. So right now we have a total of about two smart contract developers, five others on the web development front. The remaining 10 are well spread out across compliance, legal, marketing, as well as the other various business functions of the company. Yeah, I um, and tell us uh, a bit about your business. Give us the pitch. Sure. So Digix is uh, it's a company since the, has been set up on Ethereum since December twenty fourteen. So as a company, we tokenize physical gold and issue an ERC twenty compatible token called DGX that represents one gram of gold. So these tokens itself, they are all fully reflected on the Ethereum blockchain where 100% of its reserves has been audited and actually uploaded onto IPFS to represent the goal holdings that we have, all these goal tokens. Uh, to date, we have issued close to about 111 kilograms of gold, which makes it up to about $4.5 million in street value uh, and is currently tradable on exchanges like Bitfinex, uh, decentralized exchanges like Kyber, Aswap, uh, and the various others one. Nice. And um, how is it that you issue gold-backed securities? Right, so uh, just to clarify as well, I think we are currently not considered as a security uh, in any jurisdiction, just for the legal matter. Uh, these gold-backed token holdings are actually issued through a concept called the proof of provenance in the company. And what this system does is that it, it tracks every single document tested throughout its chain of custody. So for example, let's say if I were to procure 5 kilograms of gold today, 5 kilograms of gold receipt would be available through my supplier. And I would then take these gold bars, deposit into the vault, receive a custodial receipt. And every three months, an auditor would come into the vault to actually verify and check these gold holdings. And all these three receipts are uploaded onto IPFS with its hash attached to the Ethereum smart contract before they are actually minted onto the blockchain. So this entire chain of custody is available on my website right now. If you were to search digix.global slash app, you can see it under the Asset Explorer page, which will show in detail every single bar ever in existence in the company 
with regards to its entire lifetime and value chain. So yeah, uh, whenever I use the term security, it on automatically <laughs> creates some legal compliance issues. So my fault. Um, but the sure. <laughs> an important question is what legal jurisdiction is Digix in? Right. So currently we are operating fully in Singapore with another vault operation out in Canada. Uh, currently, we do not offer the token as an offering to countries in the like China, Japan, and the United States at the moment. But other part from that, we are pretty much open to the rest of the world. In fact, most of my customers are actually from uh, Europe and the other parts of Asia Pacific. And that's really interesting in um, the layout of the countries in which you don't currently have operations. It's... Uh... Yeah, I understand that you would avoid a country that has capital controls like China. And I also kind of understand why it would be difficult to be regulatorily compliant in the United States. Um, has it been easier to uh, deal with European customers with their regulation than it would have been, for example, to have uh, U.S. customers? Rightly so. Um, so as you pointed out, it's definitely a lot more complex when it comes to actually issuing these gold tokens in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, out in Europe, we actually do have favorable European opinions coming from different jurisdictions within Europe, such as like Malta as well as the United Kingdom. As regard, the tokens itself are not considered as any form of regulated product as offered by uh, a licensed entity. So right now, the uh, European audience, in fact, actually are one of the more mature and actually the older, older group of audience that we ever had uh, since the company has been around. I would say this is attributed to partly their involvement in cryptocurrency since its early movements. You had <clears throat> clients um, in Europe specifically that have been around since you launched the token. Yes, that's correct, yeah. So okay. they have been following the company for quite a while, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, They've been following the company for quite a while. Do you have clients in Sorry. Canada as well? Yeah, so for, for the American region, we do have a, a group of clients that are based out in North America. In fact, we work with one of the most innovative and forward-looking gold-dealing company called Silver Gold Bull in Calgary. The other the vault that we have set out in the other part of the world. Mm. Okay. And uh, they're specifically a gold custodian um, on your behalf? Right. Uh, so they are a gold custodian as well as a gold supplier. So they do procure mm. metal on my behalf and store it in their vaults. Um, so the vault in Singapore, is that something you manage or is that something you've also contracted out? Singapore, it's uh, contracted out to two custodians, okay. namely the Safe House Singapore as well as Brinks. So Brinks is an international custodian company around the world, uh, even out there in the United States, out in Europe, out in other parts of Asia Pacific. Yeah, I think I've seen... we have uh, two vaults here in Singapore under the Brinks. I think I've mm -hmm. seen some armored cars around here in the United States uh, with the Brinks logo on it. And mm. um, basically the service that you provide is the uh, digitization of the representation of gold, right? So you basically connect a, um, a, a buyer of gold with an... ERC-20 token, and um, do you have KYC or AML requirements for holders of this uh, token? Yep, um, so we do provide that access to the physical asset of gold for all of my customers, and we do conduct our own Know Your Customer compliance checks at the front of the purchase. So for example, if you are a new customer, marketplace today, you would need to go through the entire similar process as to what exchanges would typically do by obtaining proof of residences, proof of passports to actually onboard you as a new customer. 
Uh, and in fact, we have an interesting process called the redemption cycle, which means that you could potentially actually redeem a physical gold bar is the minimum of 100, gram, 100 tokens. You could then be entitled to a 100 gram bar at your choice. For that particular process as well, we do conduct the KYC if it had not been conducted before. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, are there restrictions on uh, token holders? Do they Can they only trade this ERC token with other registered uh, people who are compliant with uh, KYC regulation? Um, no, pretty much not. Uh, so in this case, if you were to own a token, it's pretty much freely tradable within the whole Ethereum network. Yeah. Uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, be it, on, be it on decentralized exchanges, there is no restrictions as to who can actually receive or send the tokens. However, if you were to, to purchase freshly off the marketplace or redeem it from the marketplace itself, then you would require that KYC process. But otherwise, it's freely tradable peer-to-peer. -peer. Hmm. And I'm wondering, do you have clients that have their own existing physical gold that they wish to tokenize? Um, do you have clients that come in with a physical mm -hmm. asset and they want a uh, ERC-20 representation of it? Or is it usually the other way? They have cryptocurrency and they would like to turn it into gold so then they go through you in order to purchase gold equivalent uh, tokens. So they would I'll like trade... The mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say the former is actually a, a really interesting concept. Uh, it's been something that we've been thinking about for quite a while. A lot of our existing customers actually come forward and say, hey, I do have like, oh, I would like to have them tokenized in the future. It's a concept that we're currently working on. But due to its complexities where it involved external bars coming to the vaults, a lot more audits and security checks will have to be done. So that's something that we're working on. It's currently not available at the moment in process. The latter, which is where customers use cryptocurrencies to purchase tokens, is currently available on the marketplace. So you could use Ethers or DAI tokens to buy X from the Digix marketplace. However, uh, the Digix is also tradable against Bitcoin, Ethers, and other kind of cryptocurrencies on the registry crypto exchanges. And um, I'm really curious to see how um, an arbitrage market would kind of play out. For example, cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile and they fluctuate greatly even amongst themselves on a given day. Um, gold is uh, also a fairly volatile commodity when you look at a much longer time horizon, like uh, the 10 year price change of gold has been quite dramatic because of the financial crisis. First, it grows in price a lot and then it's slowly kind of been decreasing. Um, and my question is, how does um, arbitrage play into the marketplace that you create? Because you have, on one hand, really volatile, fast moving um, prices of let's say, Bitcoin to US dollar versus something like uh, the price of gold to the US dollar, which comparatively is much uh, slower moving and the price changes are much more gradual. Right, so you're absolutely correct that uh, both class of assets here have some extent of volatility. Uh, on the crypto end, the volatility is, is extreme. You have Bitcoin and Ethereum actually moving between 5 to even 15 to 20 percent on a, on a regular day and you have gold that over a horizon of 5 to 10 year actually bring pretty volatile as well so the arbitrage opportunities currently exist um, on some of the exchanges against the marketplace i think that was one of the behavior that was observed last year in december which was why the users out there could take advantage of this and create some kind of a volume on the kyber network exchange time to time these kind of opportunities do arise, which, uh, which is rise to the kind of volume that we observe on a 24-hour basis. So as and when this uh, arbitrage happens, on let's say on Bitfinex against Kyber Network, 
that's when someone could take advantage and buy and sell simultaneously on these two exchanges. Mm. Yeah, we um, on our podcast Slack, we have a small group of people who are interested in using decentralized exchanges for automated arbitrage opportunities. And um, I've been following it quite closely, even as a research topic. But I was wondering, do people actually arbitrage the spot price of gold on a futures market, for example, um, versus your token? Is there, is there a fairly uh, close movement between mm -hmm. the value of your token and um, the value of certain gold markets? Yep, um, so that, that, that's a really interesting point as well. Uh, so I used to do that as a bread and butter back in my days before I joined the cryptocurrency world, the trust trader. So in fact, I would say that the uh, prices of DGX itself, because they are denominated in grams, or else the futures in the spot market for physical gold in the traditional markets are priced against in troy ounces. Mm. So there are there is a, a very strong correlation between these two tradable activities uh, and they do exist as an arbitrage with premiums or discounts anywhere between 2 to 3%. Yeah. Say that there are some kind of integration work for someone to do mm -hmm. in the sense that they need to have accounts with brokerages outside and they do, they do need to have accounts and liquidity available on the crypto network. Typically, yeah. I would say that because given the nature of leverage and margin trading that happens on brokerages, you don't really enjoy the kind of benefits of liquidity markets, at least for DGX tokens. So yes, this is something that uh, potentially as the market matures and evolve over time, arbitrage traders trying to make by tra trading real gold against uh, tokenized gold on the Ethereum blockchain. And that's, uh, that's an interesting point. Uh What's kind of like an average uh, day of market volume um, experienced? It, you said before that the total outstanding is a little over 4 million US dollars. Yep, that's correct. And what's the uh, uh, daily so volume just on average? On average, we trade anywhere between uh, 50,000 to a hundred thousand dollars a day across the exchanges right now on a 24-hour basis hmm. that's that's interesting actually for uh for a token that requires um uh, kyc checks and um how many users have you signed up so right now we have close to about five five hundred um act active sign up users on our marketplace by total, we have close to about 1,500 different wallet token holders on, on Etherscan, for example, for DJX tokens. I would say actively, there will be close to about 20 to 30% of these token holders that trade changes across on a peer-to-peer. -peer. And what kind of uh, customers? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of niche of people that uh, are attracted uh, to trading a gold-backed cryptocurrency. So what kind of groups of people have you uh, met as your users? Mm -hmm. right. So it, it has been a really um, interesting journey so far. We had met a couple of people who are traditional gold bucks. I would say of the, they would be of the uh, later ages and they have been investing in gold traditionally, either buying physical gold or buying paper-backed gold products for quite an amount of time. So this group of guys are the ones who got into Bitcoin or even Ethereum in its early days and have access to that kind of liquidity and they want to actually hedge it by de-risking a portfolio by buying uh, this tokenized gold because they understand the proposition of gold. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have the new group of users who are fairly new in cryptocurrency but come from the traditional financial world either as professionals or they have some form of dealings with uh, traditional securities. They get involved and, and find out like, oh, oh, there is this product called tokenized gold. And uh, by buying it, it gives me exposure to physical gold prices. Uh, so we have very varying group of customers. But I would say that the bulk of them would come from 
core believers who actually want to see tokenized assets on the blockchain, uh, in particular, actually traditional gold bucks and dealers who have been around for quite a while. So um, this is kind of like a cultural <laughs> uh, detour, but have you ever read a book called Cryptonomicon? No, I have not. Okay. Um, I would love to read it. Who, who's, the, who's the author for this book? Um, I have it on my bookshelf, but I'll put a link, t- um, a link to the book in the show notes. But basically, sure, yeah. this was a book written in 1999, and it talks about um, a digital gold-backed online currency. And this was 1999. <clears throat> and some people claim it mm-hmm. as like the science fiction precursor of Bitcoin. But um, I think the idea of a gold-backed cryptocurrency um, dates at least as far back as that. And uh, it's interesting. Quite a long book, like 900 pages. Um, But I definitely recommend Mm -hmm. it if you're a fan of... uh, I mean, you're obviously a fan of cryptography, but also a fan of kind of like historical fiction as well. Um, What was the book called? Cryptonomicon. Crypto Namicon, one word. Con, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I see it by Neil Stephenson. Yes. Right, Crypto Namicon. Okay, yeah, I definitely have a lot on this. Yeah, I uh, ended up picking up the book because um, one of my favorite cryptographers, Matt Green, said that um, that book actually inspired him to um, get into cryptography, and uh, he was one of the founders of Zcash. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the story underlying it is pretty compelling and it's basically, um, about a kind of like innovative group of, um, I would call them adventures, IT professionals and adventures combined, uh, starting a vault in Southeast Asia, Mm -hmm. um, that basically is in an island like I'm sure Singapore wasn't as developed back then as it is now, um, but basically like mm-hmm. a fictitious island that definitely sounds like Singapore. So <laughs> I think uh, it's really interesting that there are so many um, old school gold bugs that are also interested in cryptocurrencies um, because of kind of this fulfillment of this like ideal of real money, first of all, like solid Mm -hmm. commodity backed real money in the true sense Mm -hmm. and the ability to trade it uh, across borders and the growing ability of um, kind of being able to have a lot more control and access to Mm -hmm. money that is backed by this digital currency. (laughs) Yeah. This sounds pretty much like uh, tokenized assets, right? Yeah. Yeah, it it is. Yeah. It's uh, mm-hmm. the book itself is kind of like strange in its uh, support. In one way, it's really good at uh, creating kind of this ideal of a gold back cryptocurrency. Um, at the same time, it's also very um, kind of like it just plays up the whole politics of the idea of having. Mm -hmm. Uh, gold-backed, like, multinational type um, asset that could be easily transferable. And Mm -hmm. um, in one situation, one of the the protagonists was actually imprisoned, and it's, like, basically the ability of uh, being able to move your money digitally was uh, tied with his own... Um, personal liberties, but I won't reveal any more of it. Mm-hmm. I just think it's uh, it's a really cool idea that's been mm-hmm. that's been yeah. thought of, and it's just waiting for someone to do well. Um, and uh, yeah. in that sense, what um, what do you want to do going forward? Right, you have some hardcore fanatics, some new blood in finance, experimenting with new asset classes. Um, how do you imagine uh, growing a larger community? How how do you 
imagining uh, broadening the type of audience that would be interested in uh, in your product. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting book and angle. I'll definitely have a look on that. Uh, for for this regard on adoption, I can I, I can believe that uh, right now over the last year and a half, the crypto markets itself has been definitely on a on a bear situation, and we had lesser than expected amount of people being interested in any kind of products that's being offered in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, mass adoption today is so uh, it's still not as popular or not as widely imagined as it has been over two years ago. I would say a lot of our issues right now is regarding liquidity. So as a company, we're looking to improve on, the, on that front, so on to as many exchanges as possible, top tier exchanges that could offer it to a wide pool of active users. And we'd like to actually promote the idea that you could actually use these gold tokens in your daily lives, right? So you could bring back the idea of spending gold, restaurants and bars, uh, which in fact we have a couple of live partnership that's available at the moment where DGX itself is accepted as a means of payment. So that is attacking more of the retail angle of getting the token itself aware to the public and allowing them to actually spend it and have some form of real world utility. For the institutional front, uh, we're looking to actually onboard more people who would like to actually diversify either their crypto holdings or to get involved in these physical hard assets that they are not able to national world. So for example, a couple of other fund or asset managers that's out there in Southeast Asia who would like to get access to cryptocurrency, but they want to have a safe haven at the same time, could actually enjoy these benefits by having tokenized gold in their portfolio. So it's a, it's a variety of audience that we're looking at here, uh, which mostly stems from the idea of liquidity, payments, and access to physical Go go. So so I'm not very familiar with um, the Asian market. Um, I can't really claim to know very much about it, but I do know that um, in the past couple of years there has been a large influx of uh, physical gold as uh, an asset. Um, I've heard that the amount being imported by at least China and India are of a substantial enough uh, quantity to actually be um, something that is kind of recorded in like the total balance of trade. Um, again, this is from blog posts that I've uh, read from some gold bugs, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, has there actually been a, uh, a growing interest in gold as an mm -hmm. asset class in Asia in general? Right, so gold has historically been culturally relevant in this part of the world, forms of life. And the consumption of gold across central banks in Asia, be it in China, in Indonesia, in India, has been increasing, as you rightly pointed out, over the last five to ten years. As all these different governments and power actually try to accumulate gold as part of its currency reserved or even central bank holdings. Uh, I would say this demand... Is, is definitely not something that's in, uh, is this phenomenon is, is not something that's new continue over the next I would say decade or so that this trend comes to actually buying tokenized gold is becoming more and more relevant or rather buying uh, digital gold is becoming more and more relevant to the younger audience as well we're talking about the millennials we're talking about the young professionals uh, people who do not grow up with gold but are looking to actually increasingly get involved in either speculating or even investing. And um, has there also been a, a difference in what countries have been interested in gold? For example, Singapore is now uh, a major financial hub. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a tax paradise, but it's definitely viewed as a financial safe haven. And... Um, in Singapore, for example, is there a difference in how gold is perceived as an asset class um, versus other Southeast Asian countries? Right, so Singapore actually enjoys a tax-free status on investment grade gold for any investor. So let's say if you were to walk into a, a gold store today and purchase investment grade gold, by meaning of that, it, it's, uh, it's gold that are denominated in 
four nine quality, which means that they are ninety nine point nine nine percent pure gold. You could actually enjoy a tax free status on this. Um, and Singapore as a region is not just the only one that's having this sort of consumption behavior. Uh, in fact, out in Indonesia itself, a lot of savings and a lot of uh, micro lending platform have been built off digital gold, where someone could access uh, liquidity by either borrowing gold, receiving their salaries and bonuses in gold as a form of savings, the account of uh, due to the nature of opening bank accounts. Interesting. And um, has there been similar interest, for example? I think there's a lot of potential in um, lending platforms like um, we've had Celsius Network on previously, but also something like Compound Finance um, or maybe even mm -hmm. DAI is technically a lending platform. Um, has there been no. interest in gold-backed um, loans or financial products? So um, we're looking to actually build out that particular platform. I would say that we have not really gauged the interest on the street, but there are a couple of other traditional companies that offer a digital lending platform that are denominated in gold, and they do have sizable amount of volume. So to replicate this on the crypto space right now, we have the right ingredients and the right tools available. Uh, so it's a matter of time before we launch this kind of product. Uh, as, as regards to like Celsius, Compound Finance, I think that's a really interesting angle to unlock liquidity in tokens. Uh, and that's one of the direction that we are taking forward. Yeah, um, because it also creates a way for people not only to uh, take on upside risk, but also downside risk as well. Um, so people could technically then uh, lend out gold tokens um, as a way of shorting it or taking out uh, gold-backed loans as a way of essentially uh, shorting the price of gold uh, with a, against a cryptocurrency backing. Um, so that's, yeah, that's definitely a fairly interesting angle because I was thinking of uh, people like Compound Finance when they were saying that uh, there's people in developing countries taking US dollar denominated loans. I couldn't help but remember something like the Mexican peso crisis uh, which basically created a huge wave of defaults because so many people in Mexico were taking out cheap US dollar denominated loans and then their currency started devaluing and the value of their loans exploded. Um, I was also in Europe and I saw something really similar with the Swiss franc. Um, but if people are interacting with gold on a day-to-day -day basis, like you said, people in Indonesia were... Um, it would make sense for them to actually want to have a loan that is uh, denominated mm -hmm. in something in which they're accustomed to uh, accumulating and therefore the price fluctuations won't be as drastic as uh, a foreign exchange um, or a foreign currency that they mm -hmm. don't interact with or they don't have a real way of getting their hands on. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the other feature that... Uh allows them to unlock this lending is the inflationary feature of the local currency. So let's say in Indonesia itself where the currency fluctuations of uh, the local Indonesian rupiah is pretty high, that's where having access to an internationally recognized physical asset like gold, the benchmark price itself could actually help up that. Yes, and they could use it. And that could be the similar trend across uh, other economies. Yeah, they could they could use it as a hedge against the uh, inflation within their own country, um, just like the stories I'm sure you may have read about um, people in Venezuela turning to cryptocurrency in order to safeguard the value of the wealth um, that they have accumulated during hyperinflation. Um, something very similar can happen with gold, and that's also kind mm -hmm. of interesting in how. Gold is another one of those things, uh, also very similar to U.S. dollars, like physical dollars, um, that people tend to kind of hunt, hide under their mattresses in a way. And it's kind of an asset that they can't borrow against, they can't bring to a local bank. So um, it's interesting that they could find a crypto way in order to basically have the asset but not be completely locked out of the value it has. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, um, I did some work in microfinance myself, and one of the biggest problems mm-hmm. is the fact that um, people in developing countries have assets. It's just that those assets are really, really hard to liquidate, and because they're probably working in a, a black market and they don't report their income to pay taxes on it. Um, it's really hard for them to actually be introduced into a financial system um, in order to basically like make some kind of uh, loan or cash mm-hmm. flow loans for their business. So I see it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking as well for the for the lending platform. Um, how would one ascertain the density of the goal that's actually involved in the system? Uh, if it's done on a peer-to-peer basis. But yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of why I was really interested. If um, Have you registered users from developing countries? Uh, Yes, but one of the other challenges that we have is the language localization. Uh, So for that itself, because, uh, yeah, out here in this region, almost every country has its own language. Yeah. Uh, That's where we have to integrate different kind of uh, languages support to actually provide the kind of like ease of use for the for the users, mm. I could see that. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting um, situation. It's really interesting that you're basically taking what used to be normal before 1970 um, and essentially introducing new technology to allow people to opt back into a system that is gold backed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely. So you mentioned previously that your next goal is essentially to ramp up the number of exchanges and kind of uh, continue the uh, liquidity, the trend towards getting more people access on more markets. Um, So you're on the Kyber network. Um, You're also on, uh, I forgot the other name, uh, Bitfinex. 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 Uh, Yep, yep. And, um, I mean, so um, what other kind of uh, exchanges are, um, would a KYC compliant token be available on? I would say that the, uh, the KYC component of this token itself doesn't really affect the listing procedure or, or listing nature on any exchange uh, because ultimately these exchanges itself conduct their own KYC checks. So it's, it's pretty independent a service of KYC that we conduct and the exchange conducts. So the, the user itself will have to onboard on two different exchanges, uh, two different platforms. One is the Digix platform just to purchase gold tokens. And the other is the exchange itself where if they wish to actually rebalance their gold holdings or even purchase more or make an arbitrage effort. Um, so they have to conduct KYC twice on different platforms. Right now, we do not share KYC data with uh, any exchanges or any other platforms out there. Okay. So um, does that mean someone actually has to has to go through KYC twice? Or does that mean you use an exchange's existing KYC system uh, to ensure compliance? I kind of missed um, that. You, yeah. yeah, so a user will have to KYC twice Okay. if they want to purchase from my marketplace and the exchange. Mm. However, if they were to use just the, the exchange or just the marketplace, then they will have to just do it once. Got it. Okay, so if uh, someone transacts exclusively on the exchange, then the exchange manages the KYC requirements um, and that also ensures the compliance um, on your behalf too. Okay, so does that that mean that um, the the number of people who... um, actively trade your token, the 1,500 total number of people who have gone through KYC with you, um, that doesn't include the number of people on the exchanges that have traded your token, correct? Uh, um, so 
for, for that matter, 500 customers have been recorded on my marketplace okay. and approximately 1,500 in total on the entire blockchain. So I would say like maybe close to 1,000 different active users are available through exchanges. Mm. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, because you can essentially follow the trades that are done internally um, on these exchanges. Yep, that's correct. Interesting. Yeah, I know you could do that with Kyber for sure. Um, and I don't really mm -hmm. know Bitfinex that well. I don't use uh, their exchange, so I don't know if you could actually track assets within it. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, I have to ask. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Bitfinex, are you at all worried or aware of some of the issues that they've had? Um, especially mm -hmm. in their relation to Tether? Right. Uh, um, so I, I would say that Bitfinex is an exchange. Technologically, they are uh, really robust. Um, even when it comes to integrating the Go token itself, they are pretty forward-looking and very supportive of this uh, token listing process. Uh, we, In fact, we got listed via a voting program after on Ethinex back last year in July. Uh, um, there are a lot of recent headlines around Bitfinex and its troubles against backing up the USDT holdings, as well as the balance sheet um, mismatch of whatever accounts that they actually have. In addition to as well to redemption efforts of uh, dollar tokens. So I would say that the overall trouble itself has been um, definitely affecting our judgment when it comes to actually assessing the health of the exchange. Uh, I, I can't really comment on whether is it, a, is it something that's real or something that is bound to happen. But uh, we are taking every precautionary step to be ensure that uh, in the event that if the exchange were to go down or the exchange up any kind of activities, we would have sufficient liquidity available on other exchanges out there to continue the, um, the user experience and the user journey of having access to other cryptocurrency exchanges. Okay. Yeah, I'm um I'm aware that it's kind of a complicated issue. I know it's it's new um and the various uh proceedings are coming out fairly recently. Um mm -hmm. does Bitfinex require a um kind of like a liquidity pool to be held in their reserves of a specific token? I know that's like a practice of certain exchanges like Binance. Mm -hmm. They require a certain number of tokens deposited and held there for listing? Um, not really, actually. Um, so the entire liquidity pool is up to the market makers to freely decide how much they want to have deposited on the exchange. Mm. So in, in fact, that the exchange itself for DGX pairs, it could either be entirely made up with market makers' orders, entirely be empty as well. So mm. there's no really, uh, there's no hard requirements on having any kind of liquidity lockup. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And um, it's, it's definitely an interesting situation um, in which you have essentially a, uh, a business approach that follows a lot of uh, KYC and AML compliance. And I'm certain that for your customers, that's actually a benefit, that's not a detriment, um, especially when it comes to your ability to ensure auditability and full traceability of your gold holdings. Um, mm. It's also kind of interesting that it seems like you're doing everything right, um, that you still don't or haven't tried listing within the United States or accepting US customers as well. Um, because I can't imagine what regulatory compliance process you've done. You have an audit, you have uh, AML KYC, you have um, traceability, and you actually license out the uh, holding of physical gold to a third party. It seems like, yeah, am mm -hmm. I missing something? Like, is there some additional step besides the legal and regulatory costs that uh, would prevent you from entering the U.S. marketplace? Uh, 
Um, I would say it's, it's generally just the legal opinion that's required from a, a legal entity in the US. Mm. So we, we are actually working on that at the moment to try to get a very favorable clearance to enable US-based customers to deal with us. Uh, the last thing we want is to be caught up in the limb of the law. We're yeah. doing all, all efforts that we can to ensure that you know our, our customers and the entire process checks are compliant with uh, relevant securities laws. Are you actually looking at the New York City bit license or um, just excluding New York customers? Mm, I would say that there's no restrictions on different states at the moment. Okay. Uh, there's no preference for a particular licensing scheme okay. at this point. Uh, we will just have to see which is the most relevant as recommended by the attorneys. Yeah, there's this um, famously restrictive license um, called the Bit License because it's mm -hmm. offered by, um, well, essentially the uh, federal, the state financial regulators of New York City. And um, they're quite notorious for having had less than 10 approvals of tokens um, thus far. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things in which it's not necessary per se to get started. And I, I have to say that other um, tokens that I've spoken with, um, mm -hmm. state by state compliance is much more feasible than across the board because there are right mm -hmm. there's no federal guideline which states follow yet um, there are specific states that have kind of gone ahead and um, made it much easier and the state-by-state -state, mm -hmm. uh, regulatory um, process is radically different unfortunately so <laughs> as a u.s mm -hmm. resident um I kind of have to apologize for the current state of regulation, but <laughs> <laughs> it's... Yeah. Uh, oh, this is very nice of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I feel personally responsible for the current rules and regulations regarding crypto, um, even though it's not entirely my fault. It's uh, It could be better. It could definitely be clearer. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... I mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that it's not. It's probably not an approach to go on a catch-all approach, which means that we should be not. We should not be targeting like a nationwide kind of like licensing scheme because partly that could be expensive and that could uh, take a lot of a longer time. So particularly going on down, going down on state by state level could be a lot more useful. Yeah, and there are certain states in which um, specifically security tokens or. Um, tokens that are uh, targeted with uh, full collateralization. For example, if um, you were to look at Wyoming specifically, they have um, mm -hmm. certain things that would classify your token, um, having it being fully collateralized, it would actually have it classified differently than a security. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's oh, it's a gray area. I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice, but there um, there definitely are places where I'm pretty sure you could start accepting U.S. customers on a state by state basis. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're um, doing a lot of really interesting work. It sounds like you are basically set to to grow, and um, yeah, it's. It's also a really interesting time as well in um, in a crypto bear market where you have a physical asset backed uh, security in a region of the world where you don't have to pay taxes on income generated by that asset. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a nice positioning. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Great. It was uh, great talking to you, and um, mm -hmm. I wish I wish to hear more about your success in the near future. Sure. Thank you very much, Lucien, as well. Is thank you for having me on the Bitcoin uh, podcast. Is, is there anything else that you would have liked me to ask you that um, I didn't get to? 
Um, no, I think it was pretty comprehensive. Yeah, I think everything, everything was well covered. Okay, great. Take care. Yeah. Uh, yeah.